Mark chapter 13 is where we will be starting. And later on we'll go to 1 Samuel 2. The words might be on the screen. Um, Have you ever been impressed with yourself? Maybe something you did, maybe something you said, maybe you look back at an accomplishment you have, some project you were working on, and you sit back and you just, you feel good. You feel like what you've done has been impressive. And maybe it wasn't necessarily impressive, but at least it was impressive to you. Uh, this is uh, sometimes what I'd like to call the projects of toddlers, right? If you ever look at a toddler and they're doing something, whether it be building something with blocks, whether it be coloring a picture, whatever it might be, they're doing something, they're invested in it, and they love it, and they finish what they were doing, and what's the first thing they want to do? Where's mom? Where's dad? I want to show them what I've done, right? I want to bring this. Say, look what I did. Isn't this amazing? And as an adult, you look at it and you try to say, well... Kind of looks a bit silly, and it's just put scribbles on a page. But you know, it is amazing for what you did, right? And it doesn't matter what exactly they've created. Sometimes I can't tell what it is, especially if it's a picture. Rylan brings me a picture, and it's got all these colors, and it's got all these lines, and she says, "Look what I made." I says, "Wonderful. What is it?" Because I don't know what she tried to draw. And she tells me, "Oh, that's you know, that's good." Now I know what it was supposed to be, right? But it doesn't matter because she's impressed with what she's made. And Elam's going and building stuff with blocks. His favorite thing to do is to make dragons with blocks. He takes blocks and he puts them all together in some kind of conglomerate. And he brings it and he says, Rawr, dragon. Wonderful. Huh? To me, it doesn't look anything like a dragon. But to him, this is a dragon. And it's so incredible that he has created a dragon out of blocks. He's impressed with what he's made. We can be impressed maybe even into a science fair and you see the really impressive science things at the science fair, the things that obviously this person has a scientific mind, they're pretty young yet, but they've created this thing that I don't know how in the world it works and it's amazing. And then there's the people who bring baking soda and vinegar and paper mache and they pour it together and it just goes kablooey and it looks nice and that's science fair, right? That's sort of the classic, I don't know what to bring to a science fair, so I'll bring a baking soda and vinegar volcano and it'll work. Right, But it doesn't matter what it is, it could be the most impressive baking soda and vinegar volcano there. And it really doesn't matter whether you know a whole lot about science, the fact is you've created this thing and you're impressed about it. And you want to show someone what you've created. This applies with toddlers, it applies with teenagers, it applies with us as adults. It applies in areas like politics where a certain politician can be impressed with the way they're doing things, right? And they have a certain trajectory of things they want to do, and they say, and they look at sort of what has happened in the country during the time they've been in power, and they're impressed with what has happened. They have what's called a political platform, where they say, these are the things that I want to do, and if they manage to do those things, they go, yes, that's good, right? It can happen in religion where we can be in a church setting, in a space, in a ministry space, and we're doing some kind of ministry, whether it be in our building, whether it be outside of our building, and it's being fruitful, and it's being profitable, and it's going forward, and we can sit back and go, yes, I'm impressed with that. That's something that I can find joy in. That's something I can find pride in. And maybe we look out and we see all the people sitting in the pews, and we can be impressed with how many people are showing up to church on Sunday. Maybe we're doing something in town that no one else is doing. We can be impressed by the fact that that's happening and we're a part of that. But I think no matter how impressive something is, it doesn't last. You take a picture that a toddler has made, eventually it will end up in the trash can. Because you just can't keep every picture. Whether it be politics or religion, we all have our own projects, but these things fade like shifting sands. Staff changes, people move, things happen, and now we're doing something different than we were, or we're not doing something we used to be able to, and maybe now we're not so impressed. See, the disciples were in a space in Mark 13 where they were impressed with their current version of religion. 
chapter 13, verse 1. So says, as he came out of the temple, that's Jesus, he was coming out of this temple, and one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. This disciple is impressed with the temple. He says, look at the fact that we have this amazing temple here. I mean, look at the history. They, our temples were torn apart. Our temples were burned down. We weren't able to have a space. We were running for our lives. Look, isn't this amazing that we're here? We have this temple that we can meet in. And Jesus says, it might be amazing to you, but this doesn't last. This building that happens to be here, it might be something that you find comfort in, but you know what? Eventually all of these will be torn down. He's almost saying to the disciple, this might be a sign of something, but there's something deeper than that that we should be impressed about. Because this thing that you're impressed with right now will not last forever. So what can we get at that can impress us that we can carry on with the rest of our lives? Now the verse goes on in verse 3. It says, when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, they asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? That is, when will everything be torn down? What will be the sign that all of these things are, a are about to be accomplished? And then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. So he first has warned them of being impressed with their sort of a, a religious space of this, this building they have. And then he says, beware of the people that come in the name of religion, that come in the name of me even. Beware of these promises. I've heard a lot of religious promises today. You, you can't turn on the, the TV on the, what is it, the Christian channel without seeing all this stuff, right? There's some good stuff and there's some bad stuff. And there's ads on there, people selling holy water that you know, if you sprinkle it on your left knuckle, it'll make everything better. Just funny things like that, right? And then there's people who, as they're preaching, they're saying things that don't seem to line up with how things, how we know things to be. And they say, if you just do this certain ritual, that it'll be fine. Or God has given me this vision of this particular thing, this particular way of interpreting something that no one else has come up with before, because I'm so special. So listen to what I have to say. These are different forms of religious buildings, of finding something within a religious sphere that maybe sounds good, that maybe has a good promise, and maybe has a good ring to it, but it's really just another kind of empire. It's building a religious empire. And Jesus says, watch out for this. Watch out for, uh, we can do that with our buildings. We can do that as individuals. And so watch out for it. And he says, this is a sign. This is a sign that things are sort of unfolding, that things are sort of coming apart, that something is going to happen. So watch out. Verse 7. He goes on and he says, When you hear of wars and of rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines, and this is but the beginning of the birth pains. That's an interesting way of putting it. So he's been talking about the religious sphere, and now he goes and talks about political sphere and say there's going to be wars, there's going to be fighting, there's going to be things happening that are out of your control, and you turn on the news and you see all the, the horror stories on there, you go, this is, this is the way the world is right now. It doesn't look very fun. And but then he says, this is the beginning of the birth pains. We just went down to New Lisker this week to help, well not to help, but to be part of the process of this, with this couple who delivered this baby. We were helping drive them down there and drive them back and so forth. And, and there's a new baby now this week that did not exist last week. But in order to get there, there were some birth pains along the way. There was a process. There was a struggle. 
And Jesus, in this verse, he's saying this is the beginning of the birth pains. In other words, this is a problem. This is a situation. This is maybe looks bad, but it's the beginning of something brand new. Sometimes in order to erect something brand new, we have to tear down something old. Sometimes in order to let Jesus fill us with his way, we have to release ourselves of our own way and surrender it to him. Say, God, this is something that I thought was a big deal, but I'm realizing that it should be more about what you have to say and less about what I think. So this way of Jesus is new and is different. It's not about our way, but it's about surrendering to his way. To turn just briefly to Hebrews 10, there's a larger section here that we're not going to read in total, but there's a few verses here just about sort of the ways things used to be and the way things are or looking forward to the way things are, and it's talking about this, this way of doing religion in this space and how sometimes we have things that we can offer God or we have things that we give to God, whether it be our money, whether it be our time, whether it be our our service, whatever it might be, we're giving these things to God. And it talks about this in verse 11 of Hebrews 10. It says, Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. So this way of giving something, this way of offering something at the altar of God, and yet it will never take away sins. Our de way of dealing with the issues in our lives or in the world, what we give and we give and we give, hoping that it will be enough to make us feel like enough. But oftentimes the problem is our intent. We're trying to fix me instead of trying to help them. And it says it can never take away sin. It can never actually deal with the problem. But as we surrender our way to the way of God, he will lead us and everything changes. As we let our own empires crumble to make room for the next, we go through these birth pains. Because if we're honest, it hurts to let go of things we don't want to let go of. It hurts to admit we're wrong. If any of you have ever done that in your life, which I'm sure all of us have done at one point, it's a release when we do, but it's birth pains getting to that space of realizing, yes, I'm wrong and I need to admit it. The most powerful thing that my dad ever did to me is apologize. I know I'll probably share this in more than one occasion, probably because I myself remember talking about it, so that means I've said it at least ten times, because that's how long it takes for me to remember things. But it was one of the most powerful things, and that's probably why I talk about it so much. Because this was the man who he had all the power in the family, shall we say, right? He had the, the rules of the way the, the, the family is supposed to be structured. He was the head of the home. And there was something that needed to be dealt with. He always carried a belt around his waist, right? This is the guy. And yet one of the most powerful statements he ever made to me is when he came to me after punishing me for something I hadn't done, after realizing I hadn't done it, and he apologized. And to me, that was a big deal. That was a power move. Releasing one way, make room for something else. To set ourselves aside for the sake of another. See, there's a difference between knowing about God and trying to incorporate him into our, our little empire versus opening our hearts and our minds to his ways. And saying, yeah, I don't always know what I'm talking about. I don't always know what I'm doing, even though it might look like it's right. And I may have been acting in a certain way that I thought was right, and now I come to you, God, and I repent of those ways because I realize they weren't right. See, it talks about this sort of change in atmosphere. It had just talked about how we go and we give these sacrifices, these offerings to God again and again, and it never really deals with the situation. And what does deal with the situation comes in verse 16 
of Hebrews 10, where it says, This is my covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. It will be on their hearts and on their minds. After these days of doing it in an outward way, I will come and I will be within them, and I will give them these things inside of them, and they will know this is the way to go. They will know. Before we end here, I want to talk about a woman who has dealt with some birth pains. A woman's name is Hannah. She's one of two wives. And in the text of the Bible, her other wife is called her rival. It wasn't just another wife. It wasn't just, it was, this was her rival. And the reason for it is Hannah was barren. She was unable to have children. And her rival was able to have children. And so she'd oftentimes lord it over her and say, I'm the better wife. He must love me more because I'm able to have children. I can carry on his name. I can give him a son. And lord it over Hannah all the time. Imagine how that might feel. But Hannah has a miracle happen to her. And she prays and she cries out to God to give her a son. And she says, I will dedicate my son to your work for the rest of his life if you just grant me this one thing. He need us. And as we know, the son's name is Samuel, who carries on to just do so many amazing things in the Bible, becomes a great prophet. But see, Hannah knows what it's like to be downtrodden. Hannah knows what it's like to be on the opposing side of someone in power who thinks they know the way it is, who thinks they have everything put together and nothing can get in their way. She knows the faultiness of proud living. And she knows the rewards of living in humility and living in trust in God. She says, God, I am humbly come before you and I trust that you will respond in your way and in your timing when I come and I ask you. When I come and I tell you about my situation, I trust that you will do what is in your power. You will do what you will do. And then she has what's called Hannah's Song, which is a prayer that she prays after she's had her son, just sort of about the situation that she's gone through, about the things that she's happening. This comes in First Samuel 2, if you want to turn there. We'll look there in a moment. And it's just an amazing picture of what's happening here. It says, starting in verse 3, First Samuel 2, where she says, Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. She's praising God that she's no longer barren, and yet at the same time realizing that now this empire that her rival has been building has now come crumbling down. Because the only thing she had to stand on to lord over her, this other wife, was the fact that she could have kids and Hannah couldn't. And now that is not the case. And so she sees this empire crumbling. She sees this, this woman who was her rival now sort of tuck back and, and go quiet not have anything to say. The birth pains we're talking about is a very apt metaphor for the things that we go through, for the difficulties, for the struggles before the light, before the newness of life. If you go on in the verse, look at verse 6 says, the Lord kills and he brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and he makes rich. He brings low and he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. In verse 9, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. 
we oftentimes think bigger, we think faster, we think stronger, and that is the better way to go. When we see someone who's successful in the world, we see someone who's conquering, who's maybe at the top of the food chain, has climbed that corporate ladder, whatever metaphor we might want to use in this category. It's always the person who's up there and I'm not up there, and so they're clearly better than me, or they've reached a higher height than me in some capacity, in some way. And this can be in relationships, this can be in religious sphere, this can be in a political sphere, promoting our own agenda to further our own means. But Jesus says, through Hannah, not by might does one prevail. He's more about raising up the down, the down and out, than supporting the strong. See, strength can reach a point where we don't need God anymore. Maybe we forget about God. We think, I can do it myself. I've got this little empire I have going on here, and it doesn't... It, it's working. It's working. I've heard many stories of, of, of pastors who were in a certain church, and things were going well, and then God calls them to a new church, and all of a sudden everything's falling apart, and they wonder, what is going on? Why is this happening? Why aren't there so many people here? Why am I trying to start this ministry and it's not going anywhere? God, why is this happening? And God speaks to them and says, are you more concerned about what I'm doing through you and through my ministry, or are you more concerned about how many people are listening to you talk on Sunday morning? And all of a sudden it occurs to them that the previous ministry they had was all a lie. They were living for something that wasn't actually the ministry of God. It just looked that way. Our own ways don't last. Empires rise and fall. Just this past week, I watched a movie. I don't know if you've seen this movie. Cars, the third one, because they couldn't come up with a creative name. But this is a movie similar to a lot of, a lot of other kids' movies. And it's about this race car who's almost retired. And he's going along and he's had a great run and he's going sort of maybe on his last, uh, last race or his last tour and he's going well and his fans are loving it and all of a sudden out of the blue this this new car shows up and he's making it through faster and faster and faster and he ends up winning the race and he remembers back in the day in cars one if you ever watched that one where he was the rookie and he came up through the ranks and he became the star and so he goes to congratulate the new rookie and just say you know it's great that we have someone new on the scene and and and, and to be all nice to the guy and it turns out the guy is a pretty big jerk and he's left speechless. What a, he just won, and he doesn't even care about me, and I've been the star forever. And it turns out, of course, this now becomes the rival of the movie, right? Where this rookie has raised through the ranks, and he goes, well, I just clearly am better than you, so that's just the way it is, you know? And he gets frustrated, and he keeps losing race after race after race, and all of the race cars that have been with him through the whole career, they start retiring, saying, you know what? These new cars, we can't keep up with them. They're faster than us. They're more aerodynamic than us. doesn't matter how skilled we are. We just can't keep up with these new cars. So, time to hang up our hats. Time to move on. And the protagonist of the story, he decides, or through various of things, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but he ends up becoming part of this new uh, corporation where now he has a trainer who's going to train him to be better than these, these new cars. And this trainer, turns out, wanted to be a race car. She wanted to be a racer, and her whole life was told, you can't do that. You're not a race car. You're not a race car. And she would watch the races, and she'd be enraptured by it, and she'd try, and, and, and she says she even qualified for a race, and she went, and she sat at the starting line, and before the race began, she realized, I can't do this, because I'm not a racer. And she left. In the final scenes of the movie, this car who has been training, the protagonist who's been training with this trainer the whole time, he's on the racetrack and he's doing fairly well because he's got all this advice from all these different people and he's got some sort of retired uh, racers from before him who have come and are helping him out and they're helping him sort of learn the tricks of the trade to be able to get faster than these newer cars and he's doing well and he goes in for a pit stop and he says, I know what I need to do. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to let you go and he's talking to his trainer. She says, but I'm not a race car. And he looks back and he remembers while they were training, 
she was ahead of him every time as they were training. He says, in all of our practice races, you beat me, so why are you telling me you're not a racer? So they take out the spray paint and they paint the number on the side of this car and send her out. And of course she wins the race because it makes for a good movie, right? But it's interesting, the difference between her and the difference between this rookie at the beginning of the movie, right? He just figured, I've got it going. I've got this great car. It can do great things. And I'm going to win every race, no problem. I don't need anyone else. And this person who thought they could never be a race car, they thought they, it was never it was never something they could ever do, ended up winning the race. And the reason was they listened to the advice of others. They worked in community. As she was racing the final lap of his race, the, the one who had started the race, the protagonist, he takes the, the headset and he starts coaching her on the track and sort of telling her about the track and how to do it well. And, and she's listening to him and he's guiding her and they're going through this. And it was painful. Not knowing whether you're going to win. Not knowing whether you should even show up at the race because you're just going to lose. But the difference is that this car had faith in something far outside of herself. She had faith in the techniques she had learned, in the coaching that she was receiving from this, from this other uh, car while she was driving. I think the question we need to ask ourselves is do we decide to show up at the race or not? when things are falling apart, when things are going not the way we ever designed them or desired them to go, do we decide to show up? Or do we decide to let everything become too overwhelming for us? Do we maybe become jealous of the bigger and the better of the things that are going well out there and say, I just can't do it anymore. I just can't do it. Or do we decide to just show up and see what God will do through us. I want to go back and read verse 8 of chapter 2 just for a moment, this beautiful verse where it says, He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. He doesn't just raise them up to the point where they're manageable and then continue on with their life. It says he raised them up to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. A seat of honor. This is the God that we serve. This is the God we have faith in. And as we hold on to that faith through these difficult times, through the birth pains, realizing that something new and fresh is coming because I'm going through this pain now, but that's just birth pain that wants to come. That's just what I happen to be going through right now. I'm looking forward to what God is doing tomorrow. I'm looking God to tomorrow, what he's doing next week. I'm looking forward to what he's doing next year. I'm looking forward to what he's doing after I pass away. I'm looking forward to what God has next for me. I have faith that it will be far greater than I can think or I can ask or I can imagine. So I hope in our own lives that we don't just give up when things are tough, when things are hard. That we cry out to God and, and let Him speak to us and fill us with His Word and with His wisdom.